Hey everybody, welcome to Trek in Time, the podcast that takes a look at Star Trek in order and in history. What we're going to be doing is taking a look at each episode of Star Trek in chronological order, and we're also looking at how the world was at the time of the original broadcasting of the episode. And the people doing this talking are going to be me, Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write for adults and kids. And with me is my brother, Matthew. He's the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Say hello, Matt. Hello, Matt. Thank you for being literal. Mm. The listeners would have been upset if you hadn't been. Yes. Don't forget there are ways to directly support the podcast. You can go to trekintime.show and there you'll find a way to throw some coins at us. We appreciate any kind of support, even if it's just subscribing, listening, liking the episodes, and sharing them with your friends. All of that really does help. Before we get into this newest episode, which is going to be the episode Dead Stop, let's hear about some comments from our previous episode. Matt, you want to share what we've heard back from? Sure. Um, In the last episode, Minefield, uh, there was a fun one from Roatrav. I really like this one a lot. Hey, Feral Brothers, I was wondering if you guys could help me out with the Star Trek fan script I've been working on. Here it goes. An enemy ship approaches Archer. Ready this phaser. Trip. Phaser? I hardly know her. The whole bridge crew groans. Mayweather, why do we have to bring him along anyway? Everyone laughs. Archer. (laughs) Travis, you're my favorite. Spock, it's illogical for me to be appearing in this this scene. (laughs) Fade to black as the Enterprise wraps, as, as it warps away. I completely screwed that whole reading up because I was laughing through it, but I just love that little story because that basically is what some of these episodes feel like to me. Yeah, the Baki middle of season one absolutely felt like that. Yes. Um, this, the next the comment Robo, was- you fr- need to write a full novel in that entire voice. Yes, that you do. same voice. You need yes. to write a, a fan script. Yes. AJ Chan, although uh, this was an incredibly well-written episode, especially the Reed Archer dynamic, with a tension that exemplifies a Romulan encounter, it sort of takes away from the balance of terror. Knowing the Romulans had the engineering know-how to miniaturize cloaking tech on small mines, why did their 22nd century bird of prey struggle with power management? <laughs> now it seems like they spent 100 years to not so much progress on their cloaking tech. I, I do agree with that. It's an interesting view. It's like once you start to look at this episode in place with the rest of the episodes that we'll eventually get to when we get to the original series and things like that, it, it, there's just so much that doesn't quite make sense and it's kind Rat of like is a dangerous it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous game. game to play yeah and then the last comment was uh Pelico 69 said as soon as i saw the mine on the ship i just knew this was going to be another lieutenant dan moment for reed <laughs> which i thought was an awesome yeah. comment and i've i've mentioned this before in previous episodes it bothers me a bit that they're making reed the punching bag every single time i mean he is a red shirt and the red shirt you know, technically, yes. So it's like, yeah. okay, fine. A red shirts always get hurt, you know, or killed off. But it's like he's the head of security. Come on. It's like at least I mean, Worf in Next Generation, we'll get to this too. He's a bit of a punching bag at times. But then he also has episodes where he stands his ground and is really shows that he why he is an imposing figure and why he can do what he does. It's like it feels like Reed needs a little more, you know. Give him, give him a little bit of I, a. I under, yeah, I get. You that, know what I mean. But I also think it's born of the nature of the show, which at this point they've exemplified that at this stage of exploration, there isn't as much face to face contact as there is ship to ship contact. And when mm-hmm. it's ship to ship contact, Reed can't go toe to toe with some tech, right? And come out on top. He's gonna have to take damage as the right. form of fighting back. So it's like, yeah, Worf would go toe to toe with people sometimes and maybe get his butt kicked. But another time he would come in and just one punch with the palm of his hand and right. take somebody out without any problem. Reed doesn't actually go toe to toe with a lot of people. It's usually stuff like, Oh, it's ordinance. He has to disarm this mine. He has to go climb through this Jeffrey's tube and, and it could, you know, it could be this strategy alarm. and tactics. It could be strategy and tactics. Like he has an episode where he does some, he comes up with a tactical way to do something that really does kind of win the day. Like get, right. show his, show his strengths more. I don't see where, I don't think we're seeing Reed's strengths. We just see him as a, 
oh, he's going to be the first guy that goes down every single time. Oh, he got to think through his leg. Of course. I disagree with that. I think we're seeing his. I mean, absolutely. He gets his leg pierced. Yes. But he his strength is still demonstrated in the fact that he's able to talk somebody without ordinance training through disarming a mind to the point where he's able to say when it's armed, he's able to say, okay, back up a step. And still able to get them safely to a place where they've done as much as they possibly can, especially considering he has a a shaft through his, through his thigh. Yeah. I don't know. I think I'm, I I do agree. It's a Lieutenant Danism. You know, he is getting smacked around constantly. He's the pinata on the ship, but I also think that's kind of what the character is supposed to be. And it does relieve some of the red shirtism in the form of he's the red shirt who doesn't die in the beginning yeah. of every episode. So yeah. it does add attention to it where like, Oh, we know him as opposed to every other red shirt. The moment you see a red shirt going down with anybody, of, you know, they're going to die. Yeah. If influence are like, Oh, there's the guy who's going to die. Yeah. He's the one who doesn't. So it allows for a more emotional connection to what's going on. with him. So it's fair. So Matt, do you want to share a quick synopsis of dead stop? This one is another synopsis directly out of Wikipedia, but I think we're all going to be pleasantly surprised by what we hear. Okay. After the Enterprise was damaged in the previous episode, Minefield, the crew finds itself in need of assistance to effect repairs. They send a distress call and the Tellarites send the coordinates of a station that's capable of serving their every need at a cost which seems too good to be true. That is a very good description of this episode. Yes. I will say it's very accurate. I would like to think that maybe mocking all the previous synopses has driven somebody to actually go to Wikipedia. (laughs) And say like, well, maybe Make we should change. take a look at these. Maybe yeah. we should change a few of these because yeah. they're garbage. So when I saw that, I was actually pleasantly surprised. There was a typo, but it wasn't a major thing. And mm-hmm. I was just like, all right, good job, Wikipedia. You've earned your quarter. This episode was originally aired on October 9th, 2002. It was written by Sussman and Strong, the pair that has been responsible for many episodes throughout season one. And this was directed by Roxanne Dawson, who is a returnee to the director's chair for Enterprise. I was also pleasantly surprised as I was recently watching an episode of Foundation to see that she had directed Mm -hmm. that as well. And I really, I I just enjoy her as a director. I think she's extremely talented. She really knows what she's doing. And when I saw her name pop up at the beginning of Foundation, I thought, oh, this is going to be a good one. And I wasn't wrong. She handles everything from character motivation, subtleties of response to moments on a character's face to action sequences. She handles it all really, really well. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of her behind the camera. This episode originally earned 5.4 million viewers. So it was a little bit higher, a smidge higher than the previous week. So it's holding its audience. It's not growing an audience, but right now the, the show seems to be holding its audience which avoids the dilemma of losing your audience to the point of cancellation. And speaking of dilemmas, Matt, we were still listening to Dilemma. <laughs> I like what you Nelly. did. That. That a great, you're a professional. Yeah. That's what I'll say. Yeah. You're a professional. Yeah, yeah. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Nelly and Kelly Rowland were still teasing our ears with Dilemma, and they will for the next few weeks, so get ready. And in theaters, people were enjoying or getting disgusted by Red Dragon the 2002 psychological thriller fame film based on the 1981 novel by Thomas Harris. It was directed by Brett Ratner and written by Ted Talley, and it made 36 million breaking an October record previously held by meet the parents, which is ironic because it has the exact same plot as meet the parents. (laughs) (laughs) And on television, people were tuning in for CSI. There were only 30 million viewers watching CSI. So like neck and neck with enterprise. So close. Yeah. In the news on this day, October 9th, 2002, there were many headlines on the New York times revolving around suspicion of Iraq, the continuing use of secret judge panels regarding potential suspects around the 2001 terror attacks, the Bush administration pushing for more control over use of secrecy, pushback from some members of Congress. All of that were the major headlines, but this headline stood out for me as a creepy forecast of what would come later from the New York Times, lie detector tests found too flawed to discover spies. 
In a report to the government, a panel of leading scientists said yesterday that polygraph testing was too flawed to use for security screening. The panel said lie detector tests did a poor job of identifying spies or other national security risks and were likely to produce accusations of innocent people. The 245-page report by experts convened by the National Research Council, an arm of the National Academy of Sciences, said that the scientific basis for polygraph testing was weak and that much of the research supporting its use lacked scientific rigor. And what stood out for me about this that made it a dark shadow on the horizon was in coming years, we would learn that ploys such as waterboarding were being used, Mm -hmm. which clearly waterboarding when compared to a lie detector test is exponentially worse. (laughs) And this New York Times headline kind of casually pointing out that the government's use of lie detectors to try and suss out risks to national security and it being given a thumbs down, it seems absolutely devastating to think that the path that was chosen was to go even deeper into Mm -hmm. a dark aspect. On to today's episode, Dead Stop. It is either very late April or early May 2152. This episode is supposed to take place four days after getting caught in minefield, and that episode was likely at the end of April. We are again in a string of episodes without a specific date attached. So these dates can be attributed to me. I am speculating. (laughs) The episode starts with Captain Archer and Trip inspecting the damage to the ship. This episode was actually nominated for an Emmy for special effects. I think that this episode is full of fantastic visual effects for a television program. They hold up. Yes, they do. There's only a couple of shots where it's people standing in front of what are supposed to be windows. It very clearly looks like graphics added in. But other than that, the design of the space station that they will go to and the depiction of the damage to the ship itself, Mm -hmm. I think, is extraordinary. Trip and Archer are looking at the damage and they are trying to forecast how long this might take and they find themselves in a position not too different from the setup of the entire series of voyager they are in a position where if they are left to their own devices they are potentially 10 years away from the nearest space station and repairs could take months if they can even find the proper materials so there's finding the materials refining them being able to make them properly all while trying to protect parts of the ship that are incredibly sensitive. And Trip makes a comment that if the mine that exploded had exploded just a few meters in a different direction, it would have probably destroyed the ship. So they are looking at a very precarious situation. They can't even protect that part of the hull because of the lack of hull. So they can't keep themselves protected from any kind of space debris that might just coincidentally impact that side of the ship. So I I just, I do want to just bring up, like I loved the whole aspect that they, this is almost like a two parter episode because it is so tightly linked to the last one. I love that we're seeing the ramifications of the catastrophe that hit the ship in the previous episode, even to read still being unable to really walk and going through basically rehab with the doctor and yeah. the, the comment, I love the whole, uh, the regular, regular, uh, blood worms. He yeah. said, well, I can put more blood worms in there. He's like, oh no, you don't. The, the last one is still like not out of here. You don't even know said, where it is. And the doctor, the doctor going, well, he'll come out in his own. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I love that whole exchange between the two of them. And it's showing it's, it's the human impact, the, the machine impact with what happened to the ship. It's like, the ramifications where this show up until this point really is episodic. It's it, they really haven't been doing a lot with continuous storylines over arcs. Mm-hmm. So for me, I was really enjoying how tightly this linked the previous one of the previous episode caused this episode completely. This wouldn't have happened if they hadn't damaged their ship. So I thought that was right. fascinating, uh, a fun way that, to kind of wrap. Yeah. Up. And that touches on something that we've talked about previously. I'm a big fan of serialized storytelling in television. I find myself drawn to it more often than not. 
I do know that there is now a push in the other direction, especially mm-hmm. within Star Trek, the the new show that is going to be coming out about the first voyages of the Enterprise. They right. have explicitly said it is not going to be serialized. It is going to be standalone episodes. So they are mm-hmm. going back to the the format of the original series. I can understand the drive for that. I think the networks I think producers and networks are finding strengths and minuses to both formats. I think one probably holds audience in a certain way and the other probably invites new audience in, in a different way. Yes. And I think that I completely understand that. However, I think that this episode demonstrates the perfect balancing of those two. Mm -hmm. And there was a, In my research into this, I found a comment that was basically the producers wanted to specifically highlight the the realities of where the Enterprise was to depict Mm -hmm. the fact that in a calamity, the size of what happened in Minefield, what would that mean to them? Mm -hmm. And they called it continuity without being serialized. And I think that that as a framing is very useful. I would hope it would be very useful to producers and other productions of Star Trek because the new series, I can understand them doing standalone episodes. This, I looked at it and thought, boy, this is almost like a bottle episode without being a bottle episode because it is complete in and of itself. If you drop somebody into a chair and showed them this without them knowing anything about the previous episode, it gives you everything you need right in the beginning. They say, exactly. boy, that mine really did a job on us. It blew that whole side of the hull out. We almost got destroyed and now we're stuck out here in space. And if somebody says, wow, I wish I could have seen that whole thing. You could say, hey, guess what? There is an episode, but they don't but, but you won't be to lost. have seen it. Yes, exactly. And so this, I think, does a marvelous job with that. It's very different from what they're doing with like Babylon 5 or you know, they're rebooting that series that's going to be coming out on the CW. They're effectively, I, I believe, going to be redoing what they did with the first series of Babylon 5. It's going to be serialized. It's going to be one episode leading directly into another. And if you miss a couple of episodes, you're not going to know what's happening. I would hope that there would be a little bit of this continuity without being serialized done on the new Trek show. Me too. I would like to see a little bit of references back to what has been going on. I would like to see a little bit of the opportunities for characters to grow a little bit and reflect on what has happened previously. I enjoy that. That for yep. me is very helpful for fully feeling immersed in a program. So I agree with you. It's great that they start this way with it being, oh my God, we're effectively dead in space. What are we going to do? And Archer very reluctantly says, I think it's time that we get some payback for all the help we've been trying to offer people while we've been out here. It's we've jumped to the call when we've heard distress calls, it's time for us to send one ourselves. They send a distress call and I like the fact that it's a Tellarite freighter. I like it only for the fact that it's a Tellarite freighter. I just thought that was cool. I'm like, oh, Mm -hmm. those Tellarites, they're always (laughs) out there in their freighters. Just kind of like hanging out in space and passing messages back and forth. It was Tellarites who had shared uh, in the Carbon Creek episode, it was Tellarites that had passed the Vulcan distress call (laughs) It's the, it's the galaxy's From truckers. From great grandmother. Yeah. They're basically the truckers of space. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. Breaker, breaker. Good buddy. It's tell right freighter. <laughs> <laughs> so they receive response from the Tellarites. It's a very broken up message. Archer is trying to communicate with them saying like, we need your help. Can you do something for us? And they get back a cryptic response saying like, we're going to give you coordinates of a station. When they get those coordinates, they discover that at their maximum warp, which is currently warp two, it will take them three days to get to whatever is at that location. Archer tells them, let's go. And when they get there, they discover a strange looking and apparently completely vacant space station that looks dead in space. As they approach the space station, they run some scans. They discover things like it's got a liquid helium atmosphere inside. It is negative 200 degrees Celsius. It it clearly not going to do them any good as far as being able to board this thing. 
But as they sit there, they are scanned. And it is one of those. I think anytime you're watching a Star Trek show and the scanning looks like every light in the room is suddenly turned on, you need Mm -hmm. to assume that it's a little nefarious because it's never just like, oh, we're just looking at your ship. We're looking at the inside of your navel at the same time. (laughs) So this very intense scan takes place and they begin to notice strange changes to the station, which include the atmosphere inside the station begins to change. It becomes an oxygen nitrogen atmosphere. The station itself begins to change shape and they become aware of the fact that it's changing shape in a way that allows the enterprise to actually pull into the station. And when they do so, an umbilical comes out, connects to the side of the ship and Archer and to Paul and Trip board a station, which once it opens on the inside, looks like something out of 2001. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed the design aspects around the nonverbal communication. I thought was really clever. Like when they walk out, there's no signs or anything. It's just the lights are blinking in a direction, basically saying, come this way. And it's like, a yeah. universal way to communicate with somebody without knowing their language. I was like, that's a nice right. little touch they did right there. Yeah. So they follow the, the path to a room which has holographic displays showing the Enterprise, showing the damage sections. And Archer very casually looks around and says, everything here is in English. And Trip is looking at the holographic display and saying it's accurately representing damage, including stuff that is old. And points out a scratch to the paint that was the result of having bumped it with one of the small observation craft, which raises Archer's eyebrow a bit because he said, I thought I told you to fix that. (laughs) They even find a screen that it displays Reed's wound, which he Mm -hmm. has been rehabbing with Dr. Flox. So they already know that there's a level of scanning and automation at work here because they can't find any people that goes far beyond their technology. And what is effectively a Siri-like interface begins to respond to them and say, like, in a very Siri-like way. In a very Siri-like way. I don't understand what you're saying. I don't understand what you're asking me. (laughs) Saying over and over again, here's what you need done. Here are your options for payment. And the options for payment, they're given three choices. The providing of some warp coils, the providing of another like actual technical device or providing of plasma and read very quickly says, I don't think we should give up anything we can't replenish on our own. So I'd say go with the plasma. They agree to the deal, even though Archer is extremely reluctant and it's understandable. He doesn't know what the space station, whose station it is, is completely mysterious, but it seems too good to be true. Like, finding an oasis in the desert they have stumbled into this environment but he really does feel trapped they don't seem to have any other options he feels like he's making a a devil's bargain you can tell the way he's acting and questioning Mm -hmm. the computer that it's like he knows this is a deal he's getting to a deal that he doesn't know what the results are going to be which is it's it's nice to see that he's kind of listening to his inner voice telling him something's not right yeah which will come out in a conversation, a direct conversation with DePaul around that exact thing. Mm-hmm. The idea of your gut instincts at work and when to trust yourself. So Archer agrees to the deal and the computer, which I don't know about you, but I recognize it right away. The voice. I didn't No, It's Roxanne Dawson. Mm-hmm. Apparently during the shooting of the episode, she was providing the voice during the shooting, during the filming. Berman convinced her to even though they had hired an actress to be the voice Berman convinced her she should be the voice and she was concerned that people would recognize it and it would become distracting and I agree with both of them <laughs> I was very glad she did it but it was distracting because every time I heard her I thought yep yeah, yep yeah, that's Roxanne <laughs> Dawson so they agree to the deal and the computer very cheerily says Take advantage of the relaxation environment that's available for you while you're waiting for the work. It's going to be 34 hours. And so clearly this is an opportunity for the crew to have some downtime while the ship is being repaired. And a doorway opens up that goes into what looks effectively like just a small cafeteria. 
It's not particularly inviting because everything is stark white, but it's comfortable enough. It has some tables. It has some chairs. And they discover which are basically food replicators. Yeah, it's a food in, replicator in the table. That's it. Yeah. In By the time we would reach the original series, they had food replicators that were never explicitly highlighted as fantastic tech. It would be the depictions of that were largely you'd see people using these things and getting food out of them, but it was never highlighted the way that it was by the time we get to the next generation where people walking up and saying tea Earl Grey hot mm-hmm. becomes the norm. And we see that anything you ask for can be provided in a transporter like tech that is able to recombine proteins and make anything you want. And so when they first experience this, and to Paul tests it by making cold ice water and drinks it and it seems perfectly fine. And then Trip tries by making fried catfish and is stunned to discover it's very good. Mm-hmm. All of this adds to Archer's suspicion. I really enjoyed that this moment of a little bit of lighthearted, the magic of future tech really being on display. They look like two people to Paul and Tripp experiencing this the way that you and I might experience going to a tech show Mm -hmm. and seeing a new VR helmet and a new personal computer that's the size of your thumbnail. And they're really looking at this as kind of like ooing and eyeing over it. But Archer looks at it from the opposite side, which is to say, how do they even know what catfish is? And to Paul very placidly replies, well, they've clearly scanned all of our files. They know the genetic makeup of a catfish, which did raise a question for me. Why would the enterprise have the genetic makeup yeah. of a catfish in it its wouldn't. records? It, it just it like, like, yeah. you know, like, okay, we're about to launch the flagship of the fleet. Don't forget the catfish. Make sure that ge- don't forget the genetic makeup of all bottom dwelling fish. Needs to be aboard that vessel <laughs> just in case. <laughs> you never know what's going to come up and be needed. You never know what you might need in that moment. Like, oh my God, the Klingons are coming out of, they're coming out of warp. Does anybody know the genetic catfish. makeup of a catfish? <laughs> but anyway, the point being, Archer is looking at this from the perspective of, I don't like the fact that they know what a catfish is. I don't like the fact that they know what recipe to use to make the catfish. And to Paul's response being very placid and Tripp's response being like, but you should really try it. I think we've got the classic triumvirate of Star Trek. The, you You put the the characters with different perspectives. Yeah. (laughs) You put the three characters in different, in different corners and you let them all reflect on the same thing at the same moment from different perspectives. And, It really works in this moment where Tripp goes off eating the catfish. He's going to sit down. He's going to finish that plate. You know, there's no doubt he's going to finish that plate. But Archer just wants to get off the station. He is like, let me just go. I'm going to, I'm going to see what chef is preparing. So back aboard the enterprise, the next time we see Archer talking to DePaul is the time when they have a conversation effectively around the idea of like, when do you trust your gut? Mm -hmm. And Archer understands that T'Pol is not going to come at this from a gut reaction, but he wishes she would. I thought this was a very nice discussion because he clearly is looking for somebody to kind of back up his suspicion and he wants it to be her, but he also understands it can't be. It won't be. I thought it was a very nice, a very nice bit of writing. Yeah, I agree. It was a, it was a nice little scene. And also she, you could see that she wanted to support him, but couldn't. So it was, I think it was nice from both sides of that conversation. Meanwhile, back aboard the station, we're given some really neat special effects around the repair of the ship. Mm -hmm. We're seeing these robotic arms. The very moment that they agree to transmitting payment in the form of plasma, the station activates arms that begin to grab hold of the Enterprise. And in a very nice moment of slight panic, uh, Mayweather reaches out to the captain is like, Hey captain, these arms have just grabbed a hold of the ship. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah don't worry about it. I thought, yeah, protocol should, should probably be letting the enterprise know. Yeah. We're going to do this. 
So yeah. in case anything happens, don't panic. But now we're hours forward and we're seeing out the window of the, with the tables and the room is full of enterprise crew that are taking advantage of some downtime. I thought this made a lot of sense considering they had just gone through the minefield experience. Yeah. The levels of stress on all of them would be intense. The ability to go aboard a station where they could order anything they wanted to eat. Have comfort food and just relax. Have comfort food yeah. and relax. And you see Sato and Mayweather having a laugh at a table together. You see through the window, the repair work going on the Enterprise. Anytime we see shots within the Enterprise, there's a really neat sequence where you see the arms reaching in through the gaping wound of the Enterprise and replacing panels that are materializing yeah. instantly. So there is effectively replicator technology at work now throughout the ship as everything is being repaired very quickly. Trip has been monitoring this and is reporting back that the repairs are exceeding the specs for Starfleet minimums. Mm -hmm. So they're effectively going to have a better part of the ship when it's done. And we see Trip and we see Reed aboard the station sitting <laughs> having having uh drinks together and they decide that they're going to do the un most unstarfleet officer this is thing they could possibly do this this entire scene made me angry this is the one part of the show where i was almost yelling out loud oh come on like this yeah. was here's the two two like leads of the show and of the crew saying you know what we're going to do we're going to do a little breaking and entering and try to go steal some technology that's what they both yeah. agreed to in the scene. And it was so, for me, pushing the boundaries of what these characters would actually be willing to do. It felt out of line for even Trip to want to do this. And then yeah. Reed, who in just the previous episode, in literally the episode where he's pinned to the ship and is willing to die to help save the crew, talks about how the captain isn't strict enough and how the ship is too loose and people are le don't follow orders and people are a little too kind of like freewheeling Lucy goosey yeah why would a man who literally said that in the previous episode go along with trip on this yeah cockamimi idea it's like it would have made more sense for him to go i'm not gonna be any part of this if you're gonna go do this you're on your own and have trip try to do it by himself if you really wanted to do this but the fact that reed went along with it conf went headlong into the what the hell it's like this was they had a plot idea they wanted to do, and it was really, to me, sloppy storytelling and sloppy writing to contrive a method to get these two guys to do this. I thought it was yes. bananas and stupid. I just thought it was awful. I, I, I do. I think that you know, for, the, for a brief moment, I will jump forward in the plot yes. to, to that does come back on yes. what they are trying to do. They are trying to give an opportunity for a later moment when... Archer and to Paul do want to actually get into the bowels of the space station. Having had the experience of when the alarms are tripped and what the response is giving to Paul and Archer an opportunity to know exactly when and where that is so that they can avoid that. However, and here's where I'm going to put my, my little writer's cap on. Yep. Nothing that happens as a result or of Trip and Reed doing what they are about to do was necessary because everything, everything that happens later could have been done later. Later, simply as a part of we need to get into the bowels of the ship. We need to get in the bowels of the space station. It didn't need any of this. This act, unless it has a direct result in knocking down the next domino doesn't have a place in the story. So this, I think, feels to me like something somebody threw out there as, well, they should know some things about the sh station already. So somebody needs to do something like this. And then nobody stopped after they got to the end of the script to say, wait a minute, did they really need to do that? Because they didn't. Yeah, no, this what was a they do is they decide they are going to break into the bowels of the space station to see what's going on because Trip is curious. The computing power that is at work is something so far beyond Starfleet's capacity. It is so far beyond anything that they have seen from even the Vulcans. He is so curious to see what this computer must look like because the station size he has figured out. They have access to almost the entire station, which means there is a very small room in which the computer must be. 
And that small room holding a computer that small that can do this much computing is tantalizing to him. Now, yep. him raising this as an issue to Reed makes perfect sense. Yes. And as you said, if he had said, let's see if we can't get in there, for Reed to immediately say, I will have no part of this. And if you say one more thing about this, I'm going to let the captain know that you're talking about doing this because what you're talking about is breaking and entering into a station which has invited us in and given us strict confines exactly. of where we can go. I won't be a part. That would have been in character better for the yeah better for the character better for the show what ends up happening is they sneak into an air duct and partway through the air duct an alarm goes off the tube that they're in the entryway closes off and they are then transported out of the tube onto the bridge of the enterprise where to their embarrassment they are covered in soot and they are on their hands and knees looking up at commander to for the comedic value of trip saying Evening, Commander. Mm -hmm. It's not worth any of that for these two characters to have done what they did. It doesn't make sense within the confines of the show. That problematic sequence is followed by a scene that I do enjoy. If you're going to have that bad moment, at yes. least you followed it up with the strong moment of Archer basically dragging the two of them over the coals, combining them to quarters for the remainder until he decides to let them out and reprimanding them from a perspective of you are senior officers aboard this ship. You are supposed to be conducting yourself in a way that's a demonstration and a role model for the rest of the crew. And then he gets right in Reed's face and says what Matthew basically did. You literally just told me you think things are too loose on this ship. I'm beginning to agree with you. So I thought that that moment at least was the silver lining of it was the, the it was mercury cloud but it was, still wasn't enough because as you pointed out from a writing perspective this scene was unnecessary because later not to jump ahead but when they're trying to crawl through that tube again basically reed sacrifices himself to get beamed away so that they can scan and figure out what's going on to get past that point it's like mm -hmm. they could have that's all you needed it's like you didn't even That's need all you needed in that moment. Because yeah. it's like they could have seen Reed beaten away. They could have scanned and gone, oh, it was coming from that thing. Let's destroy that thing so we can get past it. That's all you had to do. It's like you didn't need the scene at all. But at least you're right. At least they did show the ramifications of the captain getting super pissed off and saying you're confined to quarters because you guys yeah. have just crossed a line. So at yeah. least we had that. But still, you didn't need it in the first place. And it compromises those characters as we've come to know them. It pushes them beyond what we would have expected out of them. Yeah. At this point, we see Mayweather in his quarters preparing for bed and you get the beefcake shot of Mayweather with his <laughs> yeah. shirt off. Yeah. And in this moment, we see him receive a call, which is ostensibly from the captain. And it's not a surprise, I think, to us, the viewer, that as soon as we hear Archer's voice, we know this is not Archer. Archer directs Mayweather to come to a part of the ship that is currently quarantined because of the repairs that are going on. Everybody aboard the Enterprise has been removed from the damaged sections of the ship, and the repair work is being done without any human interaction at all. So Mayweather responds to, like, that, that's not a part of the ship I'm supposed to go to, and Archer says, I need you. So Mayweather goes, and when he gets to the location, he finds a damaged part of the ship with sparks, and it clearly doesn't look safe, and he kind of stands there curiously looking at it and wondering where the captain is. And when we return to the scene, which would have been after commercial break, we find that Mayweather is dead. And this is a very somber sequence when Phlox is dealing with the death of Mayweather in his, at this point, unsurprising, calm manner. And we see Archer and the other executive officers of the ship being extremely hard hit by the loss of Mayweather. There are concerns and questions about why would Mayweather even be there? None of this seems to add up. And this would have been, they basically say it's at the end of Mayweather's shift. It's late at night. He was getting ready for bed and none of them can figure out why he would have gone to this part of the ship 
unbidden. There's nothing even in the ship's logs to indicate that he received any kind of communication. So the communication that ostensibly came from Archer, not only was it not Archer, but it was able to be completely removed from any kind of records of the ship. Flocks is looking at Mayweather's body when Sato comes to see her friend. And there's a very tender moment where she is reflecting on the kind of relationship she had with Mayweather. She reveals that he was prone to playing practical jokes on her, including trying to convince her that there was a new life form that she had learned <laughs> to communicate with, which turned out to be strawberry jello. Yeah. And there is a response from Flocks to her exhibiting her emotional response to this, which I it was very subtle, and I thought it was wonderful acting on the part of of the actor who portrays Flox Billingsley, where he conveys a sense of not having the same level of emotional response, but respecting and being open to witnessing the human's response to death. Yeah. And it's very in character for him, his willingness to let her come in and do what she needs to do while warning her that she might see something which would be even more upsetting. And then being there in a kind of supportive role while not quite being sure of what to say. I thought it was all handled very, very delicately by him and, and, and represented very well by the actors and by the writing. And it's during this conversation when he sees something that raises an eyebrow and he's not quite sure what to interpret at first. But we later see him reach out to Archer and Archer is still trying to figure out what could have possibly taken Mayweather to that part of the ship. There's a nice sequence with him and Reed in Mayweather's quarters. Reed has discovered a letter to Mayweather's sister that Mayweather was in the process of writing. And the two of them are just reflecting on the death of a, of a young man that they clearly viewed as a friend. When Phlox reaches out to the captain, it's when the captain arrives in sick bay that Phlox just flatly states, this is not Ensign Mayweather. This is a nearly perfectly replicant. And the way that he knows it's not the actual Mayweather is that within Mayweather's system is an inoculation of a virus that not only would it have survived the kind of discharge that supposedly killed Mayweather, it would have thrived on it, that there would be more of the virus in his body. I like this a lot. Dead virus. And it was showing, a very, yeah. Showing the replica, showing that the replication system can replicate anything, but it can't replicate life. So everything right. on his, on his body and in his body was dead and there still would have been some life in the body or on the body. I thought right. that was a very clever way that the doctor teased this all together and figured it out. And it also shows how good the doctor is at what he right. does and his attention to detail. It was also, I, th I think a neat bit of up to this point, it's been a lot of characters interacting with what for them would have been space magic up to this yeah. point. Yeah. And then this pulls it right back into a little bit of a hard sci-fi footing where it is the technical aspect of look at this virus. This virus is not alive. This virus should be alive. Therefore, this is not a real version of this virus. The body it's in must not be right, be mm -hmm. real either. So now they're in a position of we're looking at a kidnapping. We're looking at an abduction. We are not looking at an accidental death. And they begin to hatch a plan and it revolves around, unfortunately, Tucker and, and Reed's earlier traipsing through the cordoned off areas. Again, I don't think you needed that earlier scene at all. I think that Archer could have looked at, at Reed and said, you got to help me come up with a plan to get deeper into the station, past the cordoned off area. Tucker goes into distraction mode. So he goes aboard the ship with payment, which includes it's the multiple vats of plasma that are being rendered as payment. The idea that Tucker was earlier saying, or yes, well, Tucker is his last yeah. name, but yeah. that's the fact that Trip was going to distract a computer that he himself said it is able to do quantum calculations at a speed which is incalculable for us. And yet he acts as if he, a single human trying to use an interface, can distract that entire computer away from being able to notice anybody doing anything else anywhere in the, in the ship. I don't quite get that. 
but I'll allow it for comedic effect because what yeah. he's effectively doing is he is going aboard the ship and saying, I'd like to speak to your manager. He does everything except wear a Karen wig as he's trying to demand that the, the work that was done aboard the enterprise is shoddy and he doesn't like it. And what kind of guarantees, what's the warranty on this? What if we fly off into warp and everything blows up? I need to speak to somebody. I'm going to complain about what's been done to my ship. While he is doing this, Reed to Paul and Archer are back in that air vent climbing through the vents. And when they get to the spot where the transporter removes Reed once again from the tube, Archer and T'Pol are in a position where they have not tripped the alarm, so they're able to use sensors to register what is exactly working from where. They use phasers to disarm the transporter, and in what I thought was actually a very nice element of the show, T'Pol is trying to reroute some computer circuitry. She's working on a panel, and what she's trying to do is not opening up the vent that she needs to open. And she finally just loses patience, turns with her phaser and blasts it it open. Yeah. And there's not a word passed between her and Archer. Archer simply looks at her with an expression that was just like, did you really need to do that? (laughs) I thought it was a nice touch. Yeah. They go through the vent. They enter the computer room. Here was a sequence, which I thought was a little disorienting for me because the room had been described as being barely larger than the cafeteria room. And it felt huge. And yet it felt huge compared to the cafeteria room. So I found myself a little bit like, wait, what are we looking at? I'm not quite sure, but this is now turns into a scene from a movie like Coma. Yeah. The 1970s sci-fi film about people intentionally put into comas so that their organs could be harvested. We see the computer room and it is a large chamber with multiple tables. And on those tables are members of practically every species known to a Trek fan. We see some Klingons. There's a Vulcan. There's a Cardassian. There are potentially individuals on these tables that might have even been made up specifically for this episode that have never appeared anywhere else. There are likely individuals on these tables that the members of the Enterprise and maybe even to Paul wouldn't be able to recognize, but that we would. I really like that element. And all of these individuals are hardwired into the computer system. And they make a point as to Paul is scanning them to say some of these individuals have been here for an extremely long period of time. And there's a lot of neural degradation. Their brains are breaking down. They're able to identify Mayweather, locate him, disconnect him, and disconnect him in a way that I thought looked both realistic and a little more graphic than I anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. The red blood-like fluid coming out of the tubes that is spraying everywhere as they're pulling it out. I was like, okay, that's a, that's an interesting choice. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It, it definitely included a layer of, it was kind of a gritty detail that didn't, I did not expect. And Mm -hmm. so when he pulls the tube out of him and it, and I interpreted it completely as blood. That yeah. he pulls this thing out and here comes blood onto Mayweather's chest and they are dragging him out of the station. They get him off the ship and as they are trying to disconnect from the ship, they, the arms on the, the ship are refusing to let go. And it's at this point that Archer suggests to Trip that it's fine time for us to make our final payment. And it turns out that the plasma that had been provided as payment had been armed. So when they blow it up, it causes damage to the ship, which then leads to a very nice sequence. Mm -hmm. Again, back to a hard sci-fi footing. Reed says the damage wasn't enough. The The station hasn't let us go. And Archer stands there and says, it needs to reach 4,000 degrees. You need to give it a moment for it to ignite the oxygen aboard the station. And as that finally starts to happen, the explosions in the station cover enough territory that the arms are letting go except for one. And now they have to fire their way out of the station in a sequence that I thought was as close as you can get to shooting handcuffs off of yourself while holding the pistol yourself. (laughs) Archer has Reed fire a torpedo at a distance that's literally just a few dozen meters 
from the ship itself. And Reed's response is, I don't think we should do that. <laughs> and he's like, we don't have a choice. And it takes two torpedoes to completely remove the arm. Once it's removed, they get the ship underway out of the station. And then the station continues to have explosive collapse behind them as they leave, appearing to blow up completely behind them. All of that from just post the moment when Reed and Trip decide they're going to sneak through the air vents. The rest of the episode has a level of action and thriller aspect to it that I think is top notch. I felt like this episode, other than the misstep of that one sequence, I felt like this episode was a great example of a tightly written bottle episode to give you that old Star Trek sense of excitement and adventure of going in with a little bit of trepidation, going in with optimism and need. And when things start to break down, finding some way to scramble back to safety as opposed to it being the idealistic putting these characters in a position where they kind of solve some other planet's problem. Yeah, this no, really yeah. was just like, they got to run. This is, this is Kirk fighting the Gorn. This is well, this, like, you got to piece something together to get out of here. Otherwise you're going to be torn apart. Well, this, this episode, I, I agree with you is for me was, I liked the, the act one and two of the sh show really was that slow burn building the mystery box creating some tension that you know something's off but not quite and then when you have the turning point into act three it's just like it's action for the rest of the episode throughout mm -hmm. so it kind of it makes because it was a slow burn and then you have the action sequence for the remainder of the show it makes the end of the show feel a little more intense than it would have been otherwise because you have that contrast between how it was built up and ramped up so from a storytelling right. point of view from a filmmaking point of view i really enjoyed this episode a lot I thought it was a very strong follow-up to the previous episode, which I also really liked a lot. So yeah. it's like, it's one of those, for me, it's like, this is where Enterprise is starting to find its footing for me yeah. as a show. Because season one was hit or miss, and there's a whole bunch of episodes in a row that just felt like misfire after misfire after misfire. And this is where it's like, okay, you guys seem to be finding a rhythm here. Just please stick with it because you're finding right. your voice, you're finding the characters, you're finding how you want to tell a story each episode. So will that continue? We'll, we'll, we'll find out, but it's, it's, yeah. it's, it feels like season two is off to a better start than what season one had, which isn't too surprising. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that the training wheels are, are definitely off at this point. Yeah. And I think that the actors all knew who they're supposed to be. And I think that with directors like Dawson, there's a, there's an, there's a confidence when it comes mm -hmm. to the storytelling and the writers like Sussman and Strong. They know what they're, they're trying to get to. I think that the ending of this episode is particularly strong when you have flocks explaining more for the viewer in that moment, just kind of like putting a bow on it. Like as to Paul said, the brain damage to the other individuals board that station would have been so severe that they wouldn't have been able to recover. Mayweather, we see him recovering in sick bay. We know now that the station was built around the premise of effectively it's it's almost like again i think that i'm finding again and again the mixing of genres mm -hmm. when you have sci-fi with a hint of horror it becomes really compelling and it's mm -hmm. this to me is once again evoking the idea of the ghost story this is like yep. the ghost ship where you end up with a vessel found adrift somewhere in a fog and the boarding party thinks, oh, we can just look around and see what we can find. And then one of the, one of them goes missing and it seems innocuous enough at first, but when they find that person again, something is wrong. Something is off. That's what was happening here. It's the, the replacement of the body, the sci-fi aspects being there instead of it being ghosts and a haunted vessel, but the fact that they found that the computer aboard that ship was actually the brains of these individuals who clearly had been tricked yep. from their own ships in similar ways. This station takes payment in the form of passengers from the ships that come to it. And the Enterprise just being the first, maybe only that fought back. ship to find out what it was. And then at the very end, yeah, seeing the, I was going to hit the debris, stinger. 
the stinger at the end, the debris field of the space station. And we see the arms beginning to move and we see the station beginning to rebuild itself. And I don't know about you, but I couldn't help. I, I do not think this is the case. I am not saying that this is the case, but I couldn't help but think like, is this some sort of Borg thing? Yeah, no, that is crossed this, my mind too. That crossed my mind too. Is this some sort of thing that is just intended to be a proto Borg? Like we will take these things and use them and learn from them, and we are absorbing information from the ships. We are taking these things that are useful to us. We are using them, and if it's being done in almost a testing the waters sort of thing, of I wonder what's over in that quadrant, and they put one of these things in place. Just to harvest information, just to harvest and yeah. learn. I, I, I don't cr- think that's actually what's happening. Yeah. Yes. But part of me was just like the horror aspect of the Borg was yeah. present in this station. The idea of harvesting individuals to become computer I agree. chips. I, I agree. This. It's a there, horror, it's a horror element that I really enjoyed. It crossed my mind too in that moment was this is very Borg like. And as soon as I thought that, I immediately was like, that's definitely not what they were going for in this episode. They didn't want to hint that this is the beginning of the Borg. But what I did like, I liked your bringing back the whole, we talked about this in season one, the horror story aspect of this, the campfire stories. And the fact that that stinger exists, it's a campfire story. It's like, and then he chased the kid and kills all the kids. And only one kid, you know, killed them with fire and then got away. And then it's like, but then yeah. you see the hand come out of the flames and it's like, right. To be told again. It's like, it's, it's yeah. very Halloween. It's very, you know, Freddie and Jason and all those kind of horror stories. And I like that. I like that. They kind of get that little hint of like, this thing's still going to be wandering out there, taking people out to make, you know, new computers. And so right. it's, 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 I like that. And you don't ever have to revisit it again. It's a nice yeah. bottle episode of this ghost story of the beware of the ship that repairs ships. Kind of a yeah. Thing. <laughs> so I, I also like couldn't help but think, was this a thing that was originally intended to be altruistic and that the designers did not realize that at some point the ship might begin to do this kind of thing in order to improve its own capacity? True. You know, could somebody have built this thing a thousand years ago? And over time it began to break down and in order to repair itself, it computed, well, the most efficient computer available to me would be an organic brain. And would it take that next step on its own? So it's, it has layers to what this thing represents that makes me want to know more. And at the end of an episode in particular, to want to know more about what's going on is what you hope for in a program mm-hmm. like this. Agreed. So to have it tease out your own curiosity even beyond the end of the episode is very exciting. So I think that this is one of the stronger episodes we've looked at so far. And I agree with you. I think it, it's indicative that at this point, Enterprise was definitely on firm footing and, mm-hmm. and it hints toward strong storytelling ahead. Speaking of looking ahead, next time we're going to be talking about the episode A Night in Sick Bay. Matt, any speculation about what that's going to be about? I think we're probably going to be spending a little bit of time in Sick Bay at night. Hmm. We'll find out. Mm-hmm. You've been wrong before, but we'll see. Yes. Oh, I've been, oh, if I've been wrong. <laughs> and before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you'd like to remind our listeners about? Check out our other show. We do Still to be Determined, which is a follow-up podcast on the from the undecided channel where we kind of follow up on viewer feedback and talk about the subject a little bit more check out still to be determined it's everywhere this this show is so just go to your favorite podcast player and look for still to be determined and you can find us there and as for me do check out my website seanfarrell.com you can also look for my books directly on amazon or barnes and noble or any bookstore that you like to make your purchases from my books are available pretty much everywhere so i appreciate your looking into that a reminder, you can visit trekintime.show and you can directly support the podcast. We appreciate any kind of support. And if it's not able to be done that way, just listening, reviewing, liking, subscribing, all of those help us as well. We appreciate whatever kind of support you're able to give. If anybody has any comments or corrections, please reach out. After all, if I've said Tucker instead of Trip, and like Matt, you don't realize those are the same character, no, and you want to say, hey, do, that's the wrong name. But everybody calls him Trip. And so it's like when you were calling him Tucker, I was like, eh, everybody knows him as Trip. That was going through my head. <laughs> 
we really do like being corrected. Even when we're already correct. That was a little Matt burn. Hmm. <laughs> You can like, find I said, like I said, information. I, oh, I've been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you can find the contact information in the podcast notes. And on YouTube, you can just scroll directly beneath the video and leave a comment there. Please do remember to subscribe, to like the episode, and to share it widely with friends and strangers, and to come back next time. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you later.